sent out the flyer to a few of the regular classes about this. Um, I noted there, um, this is not going to be um, one of the usual types of shiur and one of the usual types of classes in which there's a source sheet and sort of build towards an idea and, and that kind of thing. Um, that's not really the kind of learning that I associate with Tisha B'Av. Um, you know, when, when we talk about Torah being something that brings people joy and therefore something to be avoided on Tisha B'Av, to me that means you're not looking at a, uh, a nicely formed and fashioned and styled uh, shear. That's not, that's not what this is going to be. Um, instead, what I'm planning to do is to go through the classic description of the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, both of them actually, uh, that's found in the Gemara in Gittin. Um, it's an extended piece of Gemara, and um, frankly, we could spend three hours on it, um, just going through it on a very superficial level. It's, it's that long a piece. And we'll, we'll see how long we'll, uh, how long we'll, how long we'll actually go. I'm not insulted if people join, if people leave. Um, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, but it, it, we're not going to be doing, you know, great, you know, tremendous insights. That's not really the, uh, the theme of the day. Um, but I hope that it will, Number one, help people to connect to the meaning of the day. Uh, and number two, get through the fast um, with an activity that is Tish above appropriate. That's really you know, what we're supposed to be doing on, uh, on this day. So um, I see that I have a message already in the chat, someone asking people to mute. So I'm actually going to start the, um, the mute for everybody at the beginning. Um, but if people have questions, comments, um, you know, please, um, you know, do interject. Um, I don't have a particular desire to monologue for a couple of hours. So, uh, so you know, if people do have questions to ask, um, we'll certainly look at them. I think from time to time I may share the Gemara with you on the screen. You know, those who are regularly in my classes know I, I prefer not to share a screen. I prefer just to be able to talk to people. Um, but, um, but from time to time, I may do that if I think that there's something of particular note in the, uh, in the Gemara itself. So what we're seeing is in the Masechet called Gitten, um, on Nunhei Amud Beis, on 55b. The Gemara gets into this discussion... Uh, because it was talking about some, something called Sikrikon. And the, the issue was essentially if raiders took the property of a Jew and then another Jew got the property off of the raider, bought it off of them, what's his responsibility to the original Jewish owner of that, uh, of that property? That's sort of the, uh, the beginning of this. But then we go way off into, again, this Tisha B'Av related Gemara. So for those who are using a Gemara, and here I'll share the screen just so that um, people can see where it is. Um, it's Gitin Nun Hei 55b, and I actually have to scroll down a bit. Towards the bottom of the page, you'd be looking where you see these two dots over here, Amr B'Yohanan. That's where we are in the, uh, in the Gemara. But uh, again, I'm not planning on, uh, on sharing it for most, of the, uh, for most of the time. So, the Gemara begins with a question which actually goes back towards what Dalia was talking about before we, before we got started. Um, Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says the following. What is the meaning of the Pasuk? And he quotes you a verse from Mishle, from Proverbs. Pasuk says, the Torah, the, the well, Mishlei says, fortunate is somebody who is always afraid. Somebody who hardens his heart is going to fall into bad. Bad things are going to, uh, to happen to him. So he says, what is this text referring to when it says that a person should always be afraid? And Tosvos actually comments on this, uh, on this Gemara and says, you know, you're not supposed to always be afraid. Somebody who's always afraid elsewhere in the Gemara, is taken as somebody who must have done something wrong, and he's afraid of divine punishment. The, um, and so he, he ends up saying, no, what this is talking about when it says fortunate is somebody who is afraid, what we, what we mean here is somebody who is 
afraid that, well, you'll see it, you'll see it here, but somebody who is looking ahead to see what the result of his actions are going to be and understands that there are consequences to the things that we do. So somebody who is always looking ahead to see what's going to happen and therefore how do I have to structure my behavior, Ashrei, so such a person is fortunate, whereas Makshali Bo, somebody who is not looking ahead, but instead, somebody who hardens his heart, you pull the ra, he's going to fall into, into evil. Bad things are going to happen to him. So Rabbi Yochanan says, this text could be taken as general advice, right? Be afraid of what's coming down the pike. Think carefully before you act, right? Pirkei avos, a person should be roas hanolad. A person should always anticipate that which is going to happen next. But Rabbi Yochanan says it's not just general advice. It's also talking about the events that led up to the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, and he says, "Akamsa ubar kamsa charuv Yerushalayim." Jerusalem was destroyed, and here he's referring to the destruction at the hands of the Romans, the Second Temple period. Jerusalem was destroyed because of kamsa and bar kamsa. Father and son is what it sounds like. We're going to come back to that. But he just says, it's because of them that Jerusalem was destroyed. There's a place called Turmalka in Aramaic, Har HaMelech in Hebrew. And it was destroyed because of a chicken and a rooster. Ashaka the Rispak or the Dispak Haru Beitar. And Beta, Rakhokba's fortress, was destroyed by the Romans, the year 135, because of an axle on a, uh, on a wagon. That's what he. That's what he says is the uh, the the trigger for these destructions. So before we go into these individual stories, which he's going to go through, I think it's important to ask what kind of a game Rabbi Yochanan is playing here. Meaning, why does Rabbi Yochanan think there is a need to identify core events like this is what caused the destruction of? The, uh, the temple. This is what caused the destruction of, uh, of Betar. Where does he get the idea from that we should be looking to say it was this that, uh, that triggered it? Anybody, any, any thoughts on why Rabbi Yochanan thinks that, that there's a reason to pick out an event and say this is the event? So what I would say is because Tanakh does it. Rabbi Yochanan, of course, is looking primarily at the destruction of the second Beis HaMikdash, the second temple. But Tanakh, when it deals with the destruction of the first temple, takes pains to say, this is coming because X event. This is happening because Menashe did what he did as king. This is coming because Chizkiyahu did what he did as king. Those who were in the Yeshaya class learned that uh, a couple of months ago. The... Um, when not just destructions of the Beis Hamikdash, um, Shaul loses, loses his his throne. Right? It isn't that um, Hashem simply says one day, okay, next time, time for another king. Shaul, because you did X, therefore, we identify key moments and hopefully learn. From, from those moments. And that's what Rabbi Yochanan is trying to do here. He's trying to provide a lesson about, um, about how it is that, uh, that, that these things came to pass. And he says, look at particular events, and specifically, look at the lack of foresight, he says. He's building on this sentence in Mishlei. He says, the, um, it was a lack of foresight that caused Jews to act in ways that brought about their own destruction. And so he says, I'm going to tell you the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. And this story is probably familiar to many, to many people here. I certainly grew up hearing it in summer camp every year. Nonetheless, there are always things that you, that, that, that you pick up along the way. And as I said in the beginning, this isn't a class with novelties and chidushim and, uh, and all of that. Nonetheless, um, hopefully it will still provide something, something meaningful. So, Akamsa u Bar Kamsa Charav Yerushalayim. Jerusalem was destroyed because of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. And here I will share the screen. So, I'll take you with, through the story with you actually seeing it. So, you, the, um, then I don't need to use the reading glasses either. So, it's uh, five lines up from the bottom. We see my arrow there. Dehu Gavra Derachme Kamsa Ubal Devave Bar Kamsa. There was a fellow whose friend was a man named Kamsa 
whose enemy was a, was a man named Bar Kamsa. Some commentators suggest that indeed his friend and his enemy were father and son. The uh, Bar Kamsa, meaning son of Kamsa, also worth noting that the word Kuf Memtsadi is sometimes associated with somebody who holds his fist tight, someone who is tight-fisted. He's not willing to, uh, to help others with his, uh, with his money. So, also worth thinking about in the context of the story, as we'll see. So, Avad Seudasa, this fellow whose friend is Kamsa, whose enemy is Bar Kamsa, makes a big feast. Amar le Lishame, and he says to his servant, Zil Aisili Kamsa, Go bring me Kamsa. I want Kamsa to be at my meal. Azal Aisile Bar Kamsa. But the servant makes a mistake. And instead he brings Bar Kamsa, brings the enemy. Asa comes along. Ashkechei Dabi Yasev. And the host sees Bar Kamsa sitting at the meal. Amar lady says to him, Michti hahu gavra bal devava dehu gavra hu. He says, that man is the enemy of that man. Now it's unclear to me whether to take this as he's speaking in third person as a self-aggrandizement, like that man is the enemy of this man, or whether it's just language of the Gemara. Sometimes in the Gemara you do see people speak in the third person. So I'm not sure we should read anything into it. But he says, you're my enemy. My boy is Hacha. He says, what do you want here? Come poke. Get up and leave. I don't want you in my, uh, in my feast. Get up and leave. Omar lay. But Bar Kamsa says, Hol v'asoi, since I came, Shavgan, leave me be, v'him nalachtmei madachil nevashasina, and I'll pay you for whatever I eat and drink. So, you know, you'll have me at the party, yeah, but on the other hand, you're going to have the, uh, the, the part, you know, have, you'll have my part of the party paid for. It's not going to cost you anything to leave me here. Don't humiliate me, he says. Top of the next page. Omar Lelo. Host says no. This anonymous host. We have the friend named. We have the enemy named. We don't get the host's name. And perhaps the answer is because the host could be anybody, quite frankly. The host, who is the one who causes this problem, right, could be anybody. Because we get caught up in our enmities, and we get caught up in making a point, and we do really, really foolish and destructive things as a result. Anybody could be this host. So Omar Le, Barkhamsa says to him, Yehim nolacht me palga de seuda seich. He says, I'll pay you for half the feast. Okay? You get the credit for this massive party, I'm going to pay you for half of it. Omar Le, lo, not interested. Omar Le, Yehim nolacht me kula seuda seich. He says, I'll pay for the entire meal. The caterer, everything. I'll take care of the whole thing. You get all the credit. It didn't even cost you a dime. Just don't kick me out. Don't humiliate me in front of everybody. Amar Lelo says, no. Nakte biyade, v'ok me v'afke. He grabs him by the hand, he picks him up, and he throws him out. And to me, that's the most painful line in the whole story. Tell me something. When he invited the guests, how did he do it? What did he do to invite the guests? Just say the servant. Yeah, he sent the servant. When it comes to throwing out Bar Kamsa, did he call a servant? That he does himself. Inviting people to the party, yeah, someone else can take care of that. For that, I'm willing to delegate. Kicking somebody out, that I'm going to do myself. That's the that that's the that's what we're talking about here. That's that's the low to which to which we've sunk. So Barkamsa, humiliated, is not only angry at the host, he's angry at everybody else who's at this party who didn't intervene. Because you get thrown out of a party, it's a public humiliation. So Amar, he said, we're on the fourth line. Ha'ul Babu Yasvi Rabbanan Velo Mahube, the rabbis are sitting there. They didn't stop him. They didn't protest. Shmami nakanechalahu. I guess they're good with this. This doesn't bother them, this kind of thing. Ezel echolbu kurza be malka. I'll show you. I am going to go use my teeth in the house of the king. I am going to tell the king, tell the Romans, that these Jews are actually trouble. I'm going to show them. 
And he goes to the Roman authorities and he says, the Jews are rebelling against you. They say back to him, who says? What do you mean? He says, Send them a carbon. Send them a sacrifice. And see whether they bring it to their God or not. The idea being that if they are not willing to bring the sacrifice, that shows that the Romans and the Jews are, are on the outs now. So, just try. Send a, uh, send a sacrifice. Azal, I'm just scrolling down a little bit. Shadar biyade egla tilsa. He sends, the, the Roman Caesar sends with him Egla Tilsa. Egla Tilsa has a few different explanations. It comes up in various places in Tanakh as well as in the Gemara. The, uh, whether it's a third, blo- third born calf or whether it's a calf that is one third grown. The, um, but the idea is it's a really fine animal. He sends an Egla Tilsa. Bahadi de Kaasi, Barkamsa, is the agent who's actually bringing this animal. So on the way, Shada be Muma, he de- puts, puts a defect on it, either Benib Sifasayim, in the lips, Va'amrila Bedokin Shabayin, or alternatively, in the pupil of the eye. Duchta de Ladidan Hava Muma, Ulidhu Lav Mumahu, a part of the animal which is a blemish as far as we are concerned. But the Romans would not consider it to be a blemish. The, um, he, he puts a defect on either the lip or the, uh, or the eye. What's the message of this choice of how to place a defect? What is, what is he trying to say? You can speak up. They, they did not. a reject. It's a reject, yes, but a specific reject, right? It's either... With your mouth and it's a baby... And with your eye, you watch the rabbis. Exactly. Exactly. He wants the rabbis who are going to see this sacrifice, this would-be sacrifice, to understand that this is because of them. You you heard, you didn't do anything about it. You saw, you didn't uh, you didn't do anything about it. That's the message that um, that he's trying to send. And it happens to be a subtle enough defect that the Romans are not going to realize that this animal is actually defective. That's the that's the idea. So I'm going to go back to to sharing this passage from the Talmud with you. So we are now right at the part where the um, the lines get wide, the first wide line. The rabbis thought we should bring this as a sacrifice in order to satisfy the government. Meaning, we don't need trouble with the Romans. They're going to recognize this as a sign of rebellion. The rabbis understood that. So better that we just bring the carbon and just, yeah, we're not supposed to, but, but we need to. Amar lahu Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis. Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis, one of the sages, speaks up. And he's not somebody who you see all over the Talmud. There are a couple of other references to him, notably a Gemara in Shabbos. If you're eating uh, watermelon or something on Shabbos and there are seeds in your mouth, then you, you have to get rid of the seeds. How is best to do it? But he doesn't come up, generally speaking. The, um, so he says, Yomu bale mumin craven legabe mizbeach. He says, if they br- if we bring this animal, you know people are going to think? People are going to think that you could bring a defective animal on the altar. Sover lamictale. So they said, all right, we can't bring the carbon. Let's kill Bargamsa. Dilolezavalema. So that he can't go tell them that we didn't bring the sacrifice. Meaning they understood the game. They understood the message that Bargamsa was sending them. And they said, this man is trying to get us all killed. He's trying to start a one-sided war between the Romans and the Jews. There's no way we survive this war. He is essentially a Rodave. He's a pursuer. He's trying to kill all of us. So rather than let him cause our demise, we need to be proactive and, uh, and save ourselves. That's the, um, that's the, that's what, that, that's the feeling. So we need to kill him. But again, Amar lehu Rabbi Zechariah. Rabbi Zechariah says, can't do that. Yomu matil mum bekashim yehareg. Then they're going to say that if somebody puts a defect on a carbon, on a sacrifice, he gets killed. 
So Am Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan says, An v'sanu sosh Rabbi Zechariah ben of Kulus hechriva es beisenu v'sarfa es hechalenu v'glisanu me'artzenu. Rabbi Yochanan, who remember was the start of this conversation, says, you know, Rabbi Zechariah ben of Kulus with his humility destroyed the Beis HaMikdash. He caused the palace of God to be burned. He's the one who exiled us from our land. Tell me something. In what way is there humility in Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis? What does that mean? What is, the, what, what is humble about Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis when he speaks up and says, don't, uh, don't destroy the animal, and, I'm uh, sorry, when he says, don't bring the carbon and don't, uh, and don't kill um, Barkamsa? What's humble about that? Everyone here is very humble. Where is the where where is Barkamsa's humility in this? I mean, not Barkamsa's humility. Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis's humility. So I've seen some. Well, first of all, Rashi here is so bothered by this that he actually says that's not what Anvisanu so means. He says Anvisanu so is not what I would have thought, which is humility, but rather it's sablanut. It's his patience, the fact that he's willing to just endure and not act. That's the way that, uh, that Rashi explains it. The, um, and that's one approach. The, another approach I've seen is that Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis is afraid of blowback. He's afraid that if he does this remarkable deed of either killing Bar Kamsa or bringing the sacrifice... You know, that's not something that's normally done. That really isn't something that's appropriate. The, um, you know, people are going to say, who is this guy to take such a, such an action? He's afraid of taking responsibility for this. And that's a second approach. But the third approach, to me, is the correct one in all of this. Not that the others are wrong. The ideas and the others are valuable also. But just from a historical perspective, the, um, there are other versions of this story that appear in the Midrash, and some of the commentators quote them here, Maram Schiff, for example, and say, it's because Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis was at the party. At the party when Bar got thrown out. And there he didn't speak up. Now he suddenly found his voice, right? Now he decided, oh, we can't do this, and we can't do that. Where were you when Barcamsa was being thrown out of the party? He says, because you were humble then, and you said, you know, who am I? I can't speak up. That's what destroyed the, uh, the, um, the base Hamikdash. But this takes us back to the beginning of our story. Because our beginning of our story was of Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan said, remember, we said in the first, destruction of the first temple, Tanakh gives us explanations for what causes it. Tanakh pinpoints events and human beings who are responsible. So Rabbi Yochanan has learned from that that we're supposed to do that. So he says, I want to look at the destruction of the second temple and figure out who is responsible. He says, Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulus is responsible. He should have seen where this was going. You could argue that he should have blamed the host of the party, right? Who is the one who, who, who was so awful to Barkamsa. You could say he should have blamed Barkamsa, because Barkamsa, in his reaction, is going to take down the Beis HaMikdash. But the way that he words it here is not that host, Ha'u Gavra, he's the one. It's not Barkamsa, he's the one. It's Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulos, who he's going to blame for not thinking ahead, not thinking about where things where things could go. That's the way that uh, that's the way Rabbi Yochanan paints it here. So we're now on the fifth of the medium lines, and I think I will go back to sharing it because sharing it has actually been uh, been been working all right. So I will uh, I'm going to share the screen with you so you can see the Gemara itself. If you have questions, please interrupt me with questions. If you have comments, ditto. Um, I would ask you, ideally, to actually interrupt me rather than put it in the chat, because it's hard to juggle sharing the screen, scrolling through to see people and make sure they're following, and watching what's in the chat. Right, right. Yes. I'm still... The host is getting off scot-free. And Rabbi Zahaya was only one of the rabbis. Why? The, nobody spoke up. I mean... 
to put it on just the one man when there were so many factions who caused this? Seems a bit of, um, not right. Just not. Right, so soon, yeah. yeah. I would expand it to everyone, to the leadership, to the people at the party. Right? It's one thing when one goes bad, but it's that silent majority who don't, don't. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. not a factor. Kamsa's only but role in this we story. Know, we know him as being, it's as if we know the story is that the fight between Bar Kamsa and Kamsa is what caused the destruction. Mm -hmm. But yes, I see Kamsa being an innocent guy in this. As far as we know, there is no fight between Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. Kamsa is named in this story only to explain how it was that Bar Kamsa ended up there. Okay. That's the only okay, reason so he's he, there. He's not, he's not I see a prominent you, player. The, um, he's, not a, he's not a player at all. You oh, could okay. make the argument. I see you, Ricky. Just one second. The, um, you could make the argument, and some do, that Kamsa and Bar Kamsa are father and son, and that the, um, there's some sense of guilt here in the fact that you could have a situation in which within one family, you have somebody who hates one of them and likes the other. They, um, and you can, you can make that argument, but I tend to think Kamsa is only here in order to show how Bar Kamsa ended up at the party. They, um, uh, he's not really a player in this. Um, okay. I want to come back to Susan's question, but Ricky, what were you going to say? Uh, the person, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, who is now blamed for it, for not speaking up earlier. I think it's brilliant. I think it's a very powerful message. Because you have to act on what is right. It doesn't matter if all the other Rabbanim didn't say anything. And the fact that he didn't do it, it doesn't mean that the only other ones are not guilty. But by focusing on him, it shows that we have power, we have individual power. And if we don't act on it, even though everybody else is not acting, that, that makes us guilty. I think it's very powerful. I definitely hear the power of that message. I want to turn it a little bit. I'm agreeing with you, but I want to say something a little bit broader here. Um, and it'll go back to Susan's question. And um, whether it satisfies her or not, I don't know. We're, we're in pain on Tisha B'Av, so maybe it's not so bad if you're not satisfied with this answer. But I, I think there's a lot to be said for it. Um, when you read through the prophets who speak about the coming destruction, and in particular, Yirmiyahu, but you see it in others as well. We saw it in Yeshaya. They, um, they, they put a lot of emphasis on the leadership. They, um, the leaders are guilty for not having taken the nation in the right direction. It's not just the big prophets, Yeshaya and Yermia, who do that. You see it in, the, in, in the, the briefer prophecies as well. People like Hosea, Amos certainly um, you know, speaks of this. There, there's a sense that Jews are going to make mistakes, because human beings do. And some of those mistakes are going to be awful, like the host of this party. But we're supposed to have leaders who are going to notice when things are getting out of hand, who are going to notice when people are out of line, and it's their job to rein things in at that point. And I think that's why he puts it on Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulis. He says, there are always going to be people like the host of this party, and there are going to be people like Bar Kamsa who are going to overreact. And somewhere along the line, there's got to be an adult in the room who's going to act to prevent this. And he should have spoken up at the party. He should have been the one to stand up and say, this is wrong, along the lines of what Ricky said. And not only did he fail at the party, but where is he now? Now he's speaking up and saying, and by the way, you also can't bring the carbon. Now suddenly his larynx works. The, um, when before it didn't. You know, and, and I'm hesitant to, I don't sound like I'm hesitant, but I am hesitant, to, um, to criticize a sage in the Gemara. The, um, who am I to, to do that? And I'm hesitant also because, quite frankly, like everybody else, there are times when I don't speak up, but I should be speaking up. You know, all of us do that. The um, times when you know something is wrong, 
And for whatever reason, this isn't the time, that's not the person, I'm not the right one, we can, uh, we can find a long list of excuses. The, um, to, you know, to play the game of, yeah, Zechariah ben Akulis doesn't know what he's doing. You know, I, I'm sorry. We, 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 we all um, fall into that from time to time. But he's pointing the finger at the person who was supposed to be the adult in the room. That's what he's doing. Look, the only thing that, okay, I, I understood what Ricky said, and I, it's just that the room you said was filled with rabbi. There are rabbis present, yes. He wasn't the only man who was probably a leader. And the thing is, it's a, uh, I, I think of afterlife, I think of so many things of one man to carry that guilt for the whole destruction for it. Right now, it's been for millennia. It, it, it's an awful burden to put on one human being, whether he's alive or dead now. His, his reputation, everything, it just seems beyond when there were so many reasons. So I, I would say two things. One is that commentators on this story do actually identify Rabbi Zechariah ben Akulis as a leader. So he wasn't just a rabbi who was present, but he was a leading rabbi who was present. I see you, Dahlia. Hang on. The, um, but the other is that, in general, you have to recognize in Tanakh and in Talmud, um, people get singled out. That this Exactly what happens here in this story is what happens... Throughout, um, throughout Tanakh and, and in, the, uh, in the Gemara, which is to say, if you did something good, you get credit for the, um, for the good. Um, and if you did something bad, you get named. And named forever. That's the, um, that's, that's the price of being a player, I suppose. Um, so you, you find this consistently, right? We, I remember you were with us in Yeshaya when we learned about Shevna in Yerushalayim. In chapter 22, um, you know, he, his, his, he gets brought in for criticism by Yeshaya by name, in a section in which Yeshaya is calling out nations. He's criticizing Ammon and Moab and Midian and Babel twice. And, th- and then he picks on this guy in Yerushalayim named Shevna. The, um, he's called out for calumny forever. That's the way it works. For good and for not so good. Dahlia, you were going to say? Well, I was just wondering, we never call out Rabbi Akiva uh, for the fact that he had all those students who died of a plague for being um, really horrible to each other and the way they learned and picking, nitpicking and, and, and uh, you know, they, they say that his students were, were, weren't kind and that they weren't, um, they weren't arguing for the sake of each other with respect. And from that, people give long speeches and, and in-depth classes about what that must have meant. Um, but we don't actually know what it was, and I think that's important to remember. Um, the other piece of it is it would be really hard to envision Rabbi Akiva as tolerating it, given that he's the one who says, the, uh, yeah, he talks all about the importance of love your neighbor as yourself and treating others with respect as Klal Gadol Torah, the great principle in the Torah, such that it, it's hard to envision him being, you know, responsible. Here, Rabbi Zechariah ben Akulis is picked on because of a particular moment in time, but again, going back to where we were in the beginning of this whole thing, the, um, Rabbi Yochanan is trying to do what Tanakh does, which is it it singles people out and singles out events and says that's what caused it. Menashe is not the only idolater in his day. Menashe is not the only king who was an idolater for that matter. 
but he gets singled out as a model, and that's supposed to teach us something. So let's see where things go with this story, because we're not done with this story. All right, I'm going to take Ricky's question, and then we're going to go further. Yeah. But do we see that Rabbi is an archetype of, of people who, who act this way, who don't speak out? It could have been any of the other Rabbi. That's one thing. Secondly, he's the one who speaks up later and says, we shouldn't do this and that. So he's covering his, you know, what. But, well, I, don't, um, I don't see that as covering anything, no. I think, I think the point is only that he knows he when he wants to speak. Something. And I think the whole point of it is, is to point out that this is, that, that we have individual power and as I said earlier it doesn't matter who, if other people do that too but we see him as an archetype as, as archetype as somebody that we should be watching out for and again we are supposed to learn from the story but I think he's a real human being who got called out for this that's, that's what it looks like to me I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to sharing the Gemara again so that we can go further in this story because we have a lot more to talk about so, we are where my arrow here is. It's the fifth wide line. Shadar ilavayhu leniron kesar. So they send Niron kesar. One of the commentators on this, um, I forget which one at the moment. I think it was the Maram Shif, said that um, it's not. Don't read kesar as Caesar. The um, who's they? They is the Romans. They is the Romans. Correct. They, um, that Caesar does not necessarily mean Caesar, it was a general of some kind. This is not Emperor Nero, that's for sure. Chronologically, it can't be. So, Shadari Lavayo and Nero and Caesar, they, the Romans, angry because the Jews did not bring their sacrifice, and Barkamsa came back and told them so, um, they send this fellow Nero. Kikaasi Shada Giro Le Mizrach, Asa Nafa Birushalayim. He arrives at the city, and he wants to test some kind of an oracle. He wants a sign, so that he'll know that he's doing the right thing. So he shoots an arrow up to the east, and it falls in Jerusalem. Lemarav, he then shoots an arrow to the west, the opposite direction. Asanafal Yerushalayim, and it falls again in Jerusalem. Laarba Ruchos Hashamayim, he shoots the arrow four different directions. Asa Nafal Birushalayim falls in Jerusalem. So he says, okay, if ever I shoot the arrow, it falls in Jerusalem, obviously there's something happening here. This isn't just the wind. God wants me to attack Jerusalem. Amar Leili Anuka, Psokli Psukeh, and he says to a child, tell me what verse you are learning. And even though we are taught that you're not supposed to believe in oracles of various kinds, and we don't look for omens and so forth, nonetheless, this is something you find in the Gemara from time to time, that people will ask a child what verse the child is learning, the child being somebody innocent, he has no agenda, and when you find out what the child is learning, you realize, oh, there's a message, I'm supposed to take a message from this. So that's what happens. He says to the kid, tell me what you're learning. Amarle, he gives him a pasuk in Yechezkel. I don't know what child this is who's learning Yechezkel. The, uh, I, I never met a child who was learning Yechezkel. Nonetheless, v'nasati as nikmasi be'edom biyad ami Yisrael, which he takes to be a message saying, I am going to punish Edom via my nation Israel. The, the, um, the, that Edom, Rome, is going to get zapped by the Jews. So Nero says, oh, this is a warning. On the one hand, God is telling me, by directing the arrows, to attack. On the other hand, God has promised that Edom is going to be punished via Israel, and I should note, classically, the sages connected Edom with Rome. Even though Edom is technically a nation in, yeah, in, in the region in Israel, not often uh, in Italy, Nonetheless, we connect Edom with Rome. A few different explanations are offered historically for why we make the Edom-Rome connection, but it's beyond where we're going to be going uh, today. It's really Torah that's not Tisha B'Av Torah. So, Amar, Kudsha Brichu Boy Lecharuve Beise, so Nero says, God wants to destroy his house, the temple, Beise Mekdash, Uvoy Lechapura Yadeva Ugavra, and he wants to wipe his hands. On that man, there's another of those third-person usages. They, uh, he wants to, he's going to punish me for it. I'm going to have to do God's dirty work. I'm not interested. 
Arach, he ran away. Va'azal v'igayer, he converted to Judaism. V'nafak minei Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Meir was a descendant of Nero. And this is one of those cases, there are more of them that come up later in the Gemara, um, in this in this sugi, if we get that far, in which you have to ask yourself, who in the world sat on that based in? The, um, who was on that rabbinical court that converted the Roman general Nero? I, uh, it's, it's a little bit perplexing. Nonetheless, he converts, and Rabbi Meir is a descendant of his. Shadrai ilavayu lespasianus kesar. The Romans don't take a hint. They send a new general. This is Vespasian. Asat tsar alatlas shani. And he lays siege to Jerusalem for three years. Havu bahanu tlasa asire. There were three wealthy men in Jerusalem. Not necessarily only three, but the three who matter for our story. Nakdimon ben Gurion, one of them is a man named Nakdimon ben Gurion. He comes up elsewhere in the uh, in in the Gemara as well as being somebody of superlative wealth as well as generosity. U ben Kalba Savua, ben Kalba Savua, you may recognize. He becomes Rabbi Akiva's father-in-law. His daughter Rachel marries Rabbi Akiva. U ben Sitzis Hakeses. And this fellow whose name is given here as literally the one with the tzitzis and the cushion. And the Gemara now is going to explore each of those names briefly. Nakdimon ben Gurion shenakdalo chama ba'avuro. Nakdimon ben Gurion because the sun stopped for him. And that's a story elsewhere in the Gemara about how he had only until sunset for it to rain, and then the sun stopped and it rained. It's a story in the Gemara in Tanis. Ben Kalba Savua, Shekola Nichnas the base of Shura'ev, Kekelev Yotzei Kishahu Saveya. Kalba is Kelev, is a dog. Saveya, Savua, is to be full. Anyone who entered his house hungry like a dog would, uh, would leave full. He would, he would be very generous and feed people. Ben Sitzis Hakesas, Shaisa Tsitsiso Nigreras Agabe Kaksasos, or Karamuksasos, that his Tsitsis, the fringes, would drag on cushions. Wherever he walked, it was on cushions. He, well, he, he lived in luxury. Ika de Amri, alternatively, Shaisa Ksasa Mutalas Be Gedole Romi, his cushion, was among the uh, the leaders in Rome. He was politically influential. So he was the one with the Tsitsis, but on the other hand, he was among the uh, the, the cushions in uh, in Rome. He had a uh, a prime seat. So these three leaders, or wealthy men, I should say, in Jerusalem, are willing to support the population during the siege. I'm just scrolling down to add more space here. On that. Okay, back, we're back up here where my arrow is. Chad Amar Luhu, one of those three said, Ana Zaina Luhu Bechiti Visari. I will feed the city of Jerusalem with wheat and barley. V'chad amar lehu v'dechamru v'demilcha. And one said, I will provide wine and salt, umishcha, as well as oil. V'chad amar lehu v'detzivi. And one said, I will provide wood. And then we get a side note in the Gemara, and I've never really felt like I too truly understood what this line was doing here. Nonetheless, Vishamchu Rabbanan Lidetzivi, the rabbis praised in particular the one who said he would provide wood. Why? Derechista kol aklidei havamaser l'shame bar midetzivi. Because Derechista would give all the keys to his servant, except he wouldn't give him the key for the wood storehouse. Why? Dam Derechista, because Derechista said, akal b'dechiti boishisin akal b'detzivi. You know why? Because if you have a storehouse of wheat, you can't do anything with it. You still need to be able to bake the flour into something. And that will require 60 storehouses of wood. 60, not literally necessarily, but remember that 60 to 1 ratio is the ratio of insignificance, right? In other words, if I have, um, if I have meat and a drop of milk less than 1 60th falls into the meat, we say it's nullified in the mixture, it's insignificant. So the wheat is insignificant compared to the, uh, compared to the wood. It's like having a ratio of wheat to wood of, uh, of 1 in 60, and that demonstrates that the wood is really important. And again, I don't really understand why the Gemara sees fit to interrupt the flow here with this line about the importance of the wheat that, uh, that is being provided, but that's the, um, that's the passage here. 
They could have held out for a very long time against this siege. There was enough in terms of the supplies for them to last for 21 years. However, there were Biryonim in their midst. Biryonim is usually translated either as ruffians or as zealots, and it's probably a combination of the two. The, um, they were very tough people. We'll find out just how tough shortly. And they did not believe you should be trying to, to uh, outlast the siege. You should be fighting. Amr Luhu Rabbanan, the rabbi, said to the Biryonim, Nebuk v'nabe shlama bahadayu. We should go make peace. Lo shavkinu. The Biryonim said, we're not letting you out of the city. Absolutely not. There will be no peace with the Romans. Amr lehu, nepok v'nabe krava bahadayu. So the Biryonim said, let's go fight. Amr lehu rabbanu lo mistaya milsa. The rabbi said, we can't support this. It's not going to succeed. So the Biryonim pushed their hand. Kamu kalinu lahanu amivrei dechite visari. The Biryonim burned down the storehouses of wheat and barley. We'll show you. Now you'll have to fight. Vavakafna, and there was a famine. And we get a story that illustrates the death of this famine involving a woman by the name of Marta Bas Baisus. Marta Bat Baitus. Now, the, um, this is unlikely to actually be her name. The, um, the word, I'll just unshare for a moment because I've lost track of people. The, um, the name Marta means what to you? So the name, does that, does that mean anything to you? Does it come from shorter? Not bitter, no. Someone else was saying what? Mary. Mary. Mary, that's interesting. But I'm going to do that here. Sorry? Mother. Mm. What is mar in Hebrew? Besides bitter, what do, what do we use? What, what, do you, what do we mean when we say... Sorry? Mister. Mister. Sir, exactly. Marta is Aramaic for marat. It means ma'am, madam. It was a matron. She's somebody of status. But Baitus, the Bothusians, were a wealthy family in Jerusalem. They're known for other reasons. So she was the matriarch of the house of Bothus. That's what we're talking about here. There are a few stories in the Gemara in scattered places about Marta Bat Baitus, and I don't necessarily assume they're the same person. It means the wealthy lady from this uh, this household. So going back to the uh, to the Gemara, so I'm resharing it here. Oh wait, there's a raised hand, so I will go back to unsharing. There is a raised hand, but I can't see where. I had a message that Linda raised hand. Oh, there. Yes, Linda. You have to unmute. No, that was a mistake. Oh. Okay. <laughs> oh, go on, continue. Okay. Please. We'll go back to the Gemara. Okay. For those who want to know how to raise hand, look for the, um, the thing on your control bar, which is either the bottom or the top of your screen. It offers the, uh, the option there. Okay. So... We get the story involving Marta Bas Baisus. Marta Bas Baisus Atirta di Rushalem Havya. She was the wealthiest woman in Jerusalem, or a wealthy woman in Jerusalem. Unclear to me whether it's superlative necessarily. Shadarta Lishlucha, she sent her servant, Va'amrale, and said, Zil Aisi Li Smida. Go bring me fine flour. Smida is Aramaic for fine flour. Ada Azal, by the time he gets to the market, is the bond, it's sold out. Asa Amarla, it's sold out because there's a run on food, because the wheat and barley stores have all been burned. So, Asa Amarla, Smidaleka, Chibarta Ika. He comes back, he says, there's no fine flour anymore. What there is is Chibarta, which literally means white flour, so it's some level of refined. The, uh, so, he says they got that. Amarla, is the only thing says, she's okay, bring that. Ada Azal is the bond, he goes back, it's sold out. He says there's no more white flour. There is what's called gushkara. And gushkara is already coarse flour. That's all that's left. So, Amrale, she says to bring that. It's sold out. 
comes back and says there gushka raleka. There is no gushka left either. Kimcha desari ika. There's barley flour. Amrale, predictable by now. Zilaisili. She says, bring it. Ada Azal is the bond. That's sold out also. Now, when you read this story, inevitably you ask the question, I can see it on Ricky's face, why didn't the guy just buy whatever they had? The, uh, why in the world does he keep going back and forth like this? So, a few different possibilities. One possibility is simply that he is so intimidated by Marta Bas Baisus that he doesn't dare make the wrong move. The, um, so, he's going to consult every time. Another possibility is that this is like the story with, um, with, with, which we began with in the line from, from Rabbi Yochanan, which is that you know, the, uh, Rabbi Yochanan had said, people don't see what's coming down the pike. People don't think about where things are headed. So he thinks, all right, so this isn't there. Fine, I'll go back and I'll get the next thing. And he's not, uh, he's not thinking ahead, and frankly, neither is Marta Bas Baisus. But one of the commentators on this, I think it's the Maharsha, gives another explanation in general for this, which is, we go through four different types of flour. When a person brought a thanks offering to God, they brought a carbon toda, they brought 40 loaves of bread. There were 10 loaves from each kind of bread. You have four kinds of bread that were, that were used for the flour offerings, and that's what this is meant to represent. They burned down the stores of the wheat and barley, and therefore you no longer have the grain to use to bring offerings to God in the, uh, in the temple, in the Beis HaMikdash. So that's a, uh, a possible explanation for why this story is like this. Maybe it's structured specifically in order to drag out the four different kinds that are, that are gone. Either way, they, um, she now has nothing. Have a shlifa misana. We're back in the Gemara here, where, where the arrow is. You can all see the arrow when I put that, when I, when I have that there, right? I'm not just telling you to see an arrow that's not visible to you, I hope. You see it? Okay. Have a shlifa misana. She's not wearing shoes. That's a theme in this Gemara in general, is going to be that the, the wealthy don't wear shoes, as you'll see. So she's barefoot. Amra, epok ve'achzi imashkachna midi lemechol. I'm going to go see if I can find anything to eat. Esev laparta bekara umesa. She stepped on parta. So parta is, no nice way to say it, dung. She steps on it and she is so shocked that she dies. The, uh, so kari ala Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai says, you know, there's a verse like that. In the Tochacha, the Torah has two passages in which it warns us of terrible things that will happen to the Jewish people in the event that we break the covenant with God. One of them, the one that we're about to quote here, is found in, in Deuteronomy, chapter 28. Parsha is Kisavo. And from that, in that section, we find the verse, Haraka Bechavaha Anuga, the one who was soft and pampered among you, Asher lo ragla, who never had her foot, the, the sole of her foot tested. The, um, so he says, that's what she was like. She was like, never had the sole of her foot tested. And when it was tested, she died from, from shock. Ika di Amri, alternatively, that wasn't what happened, but rather, Gro grows to Rabbi Tzadok, Achla vi Isnesa Umesa. She ate from the dried figs of Rabbi Tzadok and died. What in the world was that about? She was shocked and died. So we get a little bit of the story here. More of the story is coming on the next page. But here's the piece here. Rabbi Tzadok, Rabbi Tzadok was one of the sages, an extremely pious one, living in the time before the destruction of the Second Temple. He fasted for 40 years that Jerusalem should not be destroyed. No, that does not necessarily mean that he's fasting day, 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 day. In other words, that he's fasting every day for 40 years. The, um, whether it's Monday, Thursday fasts, whether it's um, you know in the day and then eating at night, unclear. The Gemara does not say. But whatever he did for these 40 years, he is so emaciated that when he recovers, he has to have the following, uh, the following regimen. When he ate anything, it was visible from outside. Like the, if you think, I mean, 
I hate to make this comparison, but the Holocaust survivors and how emaciated they were afterwards, when he, when he eat something, when he would eat something, it was actually visible that there was food in him. The Chayav of Barya, and when he was being healed, Maisi lay grogros. They brought him dry figs. Mayitz Mayu, and he would suck out whatever liquid he could get from it. Mashad and he would throw out the fig. That's what he, that's what he did, and that was what she found and tried to eat. And I don't want to get into questions of symbolism and the fig and so forth. It's really beyond, as I said in the beginning uh, at 3 o'clock today, it's beyond where we're going with this, uh, with the Tisha of learning. But, when she was dying, she took out all of her gold and silver. I'm just scrolling down here. Shadise Bashuka, and she threw it out in the market. Amra Hai Lamai Miboili. She said, What do I need any of this for? Can't buy any wheat. Vainu Dirsib, as the Torah as we also find predicted in the prophet Yechezkel, well he's not predicting, he lived it. Kaspam Bachutsos Yashlichu, Yechezkel lived through the destruction of the temple. Kaspam Bachutsos Yashlichu, they throw out their money in the uh, in the streets. So here we get a story along the way, which is meant to illustrate something for us. Why did we go through this Marta Bas Baisa's story? What was the point of this story? Why was this here? Is this a crispy compared to the money that couldn't do? We all, we all want the riches and the Jews sin because they went after all the riches. And in the end, all your riches did nothing to help you. You, you lived this pampered life and didn't do you any good instead of doing these spot and sharing your every, you know, all the your gold, silver, etc. Now you realize it's done nothing in the sum total of your life to make your life better. So what it is, I mean, more or less along the lines of what Susan is saying. I mean, it's directly here to illustrate the destruction of the storehouses and the starvation in Jerusalem. That's you know how it fits into the account. However. It is a message here about the powerful. Go back to prophets like Amos, like Yeshaya, who criticized those who were in power and said they amassed their wealth by taking it from the needy. There's going to come a time when their wealth is going to be completely useless. And this is a fulfillment of uh, of that prophecy. Here you have somebody who, who was doing very well from the wealthiest families in Jerusalem, and, uh, and now it's completely useless to them. So remember, we, we talked about how this is supposed to be about the seeds of destruction. This is one of those seeds that's being identified for us. So let's see what happens now with this, uh, with this siege, now that the Jews don't have the means of outlasting it. Okay. Abba Sikra, the last two words on the line here where the arrow is. Abba Sikra, Reish Biryone di Ushalayim. Abba Sikra was the leader of these Biryonim in Jerusalem. By the way, I'll say what I said before. Um, I'm just going to keep on going, I think, with this Gemara. Um, those who need to go, those who aren't feeling well, I'm not insulted. But don't expect me to call a halt at four, because um, we're an hour in. Like, as far as I'm concerned, I'll just go as long as anybody wants to, uh, to, to keep on, on learning. So, Abba Sikra Reish Bayone Jerusalem. Abba Sikra was the head of the zealots in Jerusalem. Bar Achse de Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. He was also the nephew of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Small, small world. So the head of the zealots is the nephew of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who is one of the leaders of the sages. Habashalach lay, tabit sina legaboy. So he sent a message to him, unclear which one is the he and which one is the him, but he said, come to me in secret. Asa came to him. Amar lay, ad emas abdisu hachi bekalisu elahav bekafna. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai says to Habashikra, you guys are killing us. How long are you going to keep destroying supplies? You're going to kill everybody in famine. Amalei, mighty Yavid. He said, what can I do? Diamina lahumidi kaluli. Abbasikra says, don't kid yourself. You think that I'm powerful. I'm, you know, running the show here. They, uh, if I say anything, they'll kill me. Amalei, chazili takanta lididi. Deibok. 
he says, or Yochanan ben Zakkai says, find a way for me to get out of the city. Esher da Aviyat Salaporta. And perhaps, perhaps I can save something. So Amar lay, Nikot Navshoch Bekitsiri. So Avasikra says, okay, here's what you do. Pretend to be deathly ill. Valese Kulei Ama Valishai Lubach. And then let everybody come and ask after you. So that it becomes well known that you're very ill. Vaisi midi saria and bring something that smells awful. Vaagni gabach and store it with you. Vlamer the nachnavshach and let them say that you've died. Vlailu bach talmidach and make sure it's your students who carry you. Vlaleil bach inishachrina not anybody else. Dolalirgishin bach to kolilat so that they won't be able to tell that you don't weigh much. What do you mean? So I'm just going to have to close this a little bit so that we can see the rest of the Gemara. So that they don't sense that you are very light. Because they know that the living are lighter than the dead. Now, that doesn't mean that this is a statement about physics. That, um, that if you weigh a, uh, a live person and you weigh them when they're dead, you'll find that they actually are heavier now, right? The classic 21 grams myth says that you can measure a dead body a little lighter than the, than the person was when they were alive because the soul weighed 21 grams, and, uh, and now that's gone. This is the opposite. It says that the dead weigh more, but it doesn't mean from, from the standpoint of objective weight um, what it means, I under, as I understand it, is that if you're carrying a person's body, they shift in ways that just naturally tend to distribute the weight such that it's easier to be carried, so that they don't fall, so that they don't get, get dropped. And, they, um, and the fear is you are going to be, you know, you're going to be carried the way they're carrying him without a, without a uh, you know, he's not being carried in a coffin. They, um, they'll be able to tell that you're a live person based on the way your weight is, uh, is distributed. So make sure it's your students who are carrying. Avid Hafi, that's what they did. Nichnas bo Rabbi Eliezer mitzad echad, Rabbi Yeshua mitzad acher. So Rabbi Eliezer is carrying on one side, Rabbi Yeshua is carrying on the other side. Kimatu lepischa, they get to the entrance to the city. Bola midkare, they, the Bryonim, the zealots, want to stab him. They want to make sure he's really dead. Amar So they said, you know, Yomru Rabban Dakru. You want to do that in front of the Romans? The Romans are going to say, these Jews stab their leaders. Rashi points out here, you see where I've moved the arrow, that it's Abbasikra, the Biryon, who himself, right, the zealot himself, who says this. So he has credibility. He says, we can't stab him if we stab him, the Romans are going to mock us. Look what they do. They stab their leaders. So they said, all right, let's at least shove him around a little bit. Maybe he'll cry out. But again, Abbasikra says, they're going to say, look what they do. Look how they treat their, uh, their leaders. So they open the gate. Nafak gets out of the city. When he gets there, their meaning to Vespasian, Omar Shlama Allah Malka Shlama Allah Malka. He says, Greetings to you, O King. Greetings to you, O King. Omar Le Machaibis Trekatala. So Vespasian says to him, You're liable for death twice. What do you mean? Chada de la Malka Navakaris Li Malka. I am not the king, and you're calling me the king. You're making fun of me. That's a bad idea to a general. Visu and further, E Malka Anna, if I really am the king, Adha Idna Amailo Asis Legaboy. Why is it that you haven't shown up until now? If I'm the king, you should have sent somebody to honor me. Amarle, to which he responded, Dika'amre love Malka and uh, as far as your statement of, well, I'm not the king, Ivra Malka'at, you're about to become the king. How do I know that? De'i love Malka'at, because if you weren't a king, lo mimsro yushalayim biyadach, Jerusalem would not be given into your hands. Dixiv, and he quotes you a text from Yeshaya chapter 10, Vaha Levanon ba'adir yipol. The Levanon will fall to the mighty. And Levanon is a reference to the temple, to the base Hamikdash, as we're going to see in one more line in the Gemara. Ve'in adir, elamelech, and the word adir must refer to a king. Dixiv, because the Pasuk says in Yermio, Vaya adiro mimenu. His adir will be from him. His adir, his king. 
will be from him. How do you know that Lebanon is the temple, is the base Hamikdash? Vein Lebanon ela base Hamikdash shenema hahara tovaze vahalavanon. Because when Moshe sees the entire land, they uh, or he wants to, he says, I want to see. I want to see this fine mountain and the Lebanon. He wants to see the Lebanon. What Lebanon and mountain? It's Harabai, the Temple Mount and the Temple, the Beis Hamikdash. Other reasons to say Lebanon would be the Beis Hamikdash. What else could you come up with as a reason to say Lebanon is the Temple? Because of the, the wood that was used to, to build the temple. Correct. We use the cedars of Lebanon. That's a reason. And what else? You're right, but what else? The, um, so it's, it's Malbin Abon Hosein Shal Yisrael. It cleans up, it cleanses the sins of Israel. The uh, Lavan, Lebanon from, uh, from Lavan. But you have, you have lots of reasons to say that uh, Lebanon is a reference to the Beis HaMikdash. So he says, the, um, the, since I am told Lebanon will fall to an Adir, the Beis HaMikdash falls to a Melech, the temple falls to a king. So therefore, you must be a king. He says, that's the idea. Well, Udika Amrit, and when you said, Imalka Ano Amailo Kaasis Legaboy, if I'm the king, why haven't you shown up until now? Ada inna biryone de isban lo shakinan. The zealots among us wouldn't let me go until now. So Vespasian says back to him, Amar lei, ilu chavis shel dvash b'dei rakon karuch alei. Lo ayu shorven es hachavis b'shvil dei rakon. He said, if you had a barrel of honey, and there was a snake coiled around it, wouldn't you break the barrel in order to get rid of the snake? So Jerusalem is the barrel of honey. The snake are the zealots. You want to get rid of the zealots? Break open the city. Ishtik, Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai is silent. Kari Alei Rabbi Yosef. Rabbi Yosef, in a later generation, says about him, Be'itema Rabbi Akiva. Some say Rabbi Akiva said this. There's a verse in Yeshaya, Meshiv Chachamim Achor V'da'atam Yisachel. In context, it's a reference to God, if I remember correctly. That he sends back, he turns back the sages and makes them foolish. Meaning, Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai should have known what to answer. It's odd that he didn't know what to say. What he should have said to him was, What he should have said was, No, if you have a barrel of honey, and there's a snake around it, what you do is you bring a stick, you use the stick to get rid of the, uh, the snake, kill the snake, and your barrel is fine. Leave the barrel alone. So in other words, what you should have said was, we're using the Romans like a stick. However, I have to say that I think Rabbi Yochum and Zakkai is right. Because you don't really want to tell Vespasian we're using you to get rid of our zealots. Like, that's not necessarily a winning thing to say. We're using you as our tool. So I, I'm actually more comfortable with him not, not answering Vespasian. But in any case... Adahachi at this point, we're in the beginning of the wide lines. Asi pristika alei me romi. An agent comes from Rome. Amale says to Vespasian, Kum, get up. Demisle, well, he probably didn't say it that way, he said probably rise. Demisle Caesar, Caesar is dead. Va'amri hanu chashivi de romi lo sivach beresha. The leaders in Rome have said, You are the new Caesar. Havasai machad misane. He was wearing one shoe at the time. This is what I meant when I said to you that we're going to come back to people being powerful people being barefoot. He's either wearing one shoe at the time or he put on one shoe. Either way, he tries to put on the other shoe and he can't do it. It won't get on. So he says, well, let him take off the other shoe. Get a larger pair. It won't come off. He says, what in the world is that? Amarle, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai says, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was not in the room when the agent came to bring the message, as you'll see. He says to him, Lo titzta'er, don't, don't worry. Must be, Shmua tova asyalach. Must be, you just got good news. Dichsiv, because we are told in Mishle in Proverbs, Shmua tova tidashen etzem. Good news bloats one's bones. They, uh, it engorges. You're inflated now. I don't know if there's increased blood flow. But 
That's why you're, uh, you're all excited now, but there's good news. That's why you can't get your shoe on, and the other one you can't get off. Ella maita kante. So what? What do you do now? Leisei inishtalom miyasva daitoch minei. So Yochanan Mezakai says to him, bring somebody you don't like. V'lech lif kamach. And let him pass before you. Dechsev, as the Pasuk also in Mishlei, in Proverbs, says, V'ruach nechaya tiyaveish garem. A low spirit dries out the bones. That will deflate you. Avarachi, he did it. Brought some guy he didn't like. Don't know who. Ayel, and sure enough, he was able to get the other shoe on. So now, Vespasian needs to go back and humiliate Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai one more time, since Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai showed himself to be so smart. Amrle, he says, Why didn't you come to me until now? Amrle, he said, Didn't I answer you already? I couldn't, because of the Bionim. He said, yeah, but I answered you. You should have broken open the city in order to get rid of these zealots. In any case, Vespasian says, Amarle, Mezala Zilna. He says, I'm going home. I'm going back to Rome. Vinishachrina Mishadarna. And I'm going to send somebody else. Meaning, the, insp- the invasion isn't over. We're just going to send another general. Ela vi'iminoi midi de etein alach. But ask me for something that I will give you. Emphasis on midi de etein alach. Ask for something that I will actually give you. So Yochanan ben Zakkai says, All right, I got three wishes. Amarle. He says, Tainli Yavne Bachachamel. Give me Yavne and the sages of Yavne. Remember that the Sanhedrin, the high court, moved out of the temple in Jerusalem before the temple was destroyed. They at one point were in the city of Usha, and another point they're in uh, they're in Yavne. So at this point clearly they are in Yavne, and he says I would like you to spare Yavne and the uh, and the sages of Yavne. That's my uh, that's my request. So, hang on one second. Okay, the, um, he says I would like you to spare Yavne. That's that's my that's my first uh, that's my first request. Number two, Vishushilta de Rabban Gamliel, the line of Rabban Gamliel. That family has to survive. Rabbi Gamliel is the Nasi. He is the leader of the Jews in Israel, descendant of King David. Preserve that family line. Ve'asvasa de Messiah le'la Rabbi Tzadok, and the cure for Rabbi Tzadok, that great sage who fasted for 40 years, we read about on the previous page. So, I want your doctors to heal him. So, those are my three requests. And at that point, we get, again, an interjection of criticism for Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Kari Ale Rabbi Yosef, Vitem Rabbi Akiva, either Rabbi Yosef or Rabbi Akiva said, Meishim Chachamim Achor V'datam Yisachel. He turns back the sages. He makes them foolish. Iboy Lameru Lei Lishpekinu Hadazimna. He should have said, Leave us alone. But Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai's thinking is, you know, as we say, tafasta maruba lo tafasta. You try to get too much, you don't get anything. I'm not going to ask the, uh, the uh, this uh, soon-to-be emperor or now emperor to uh, to spare us because that's not happening. At least. Let me ask him for that which we need in order to be preserved. So we'll have our sages, we'll have our leaders, we'll have the uh, the Davidic line. Compromise. So the Gemara then asks along the way, Asvasa the Messiah Leila Rabbi Tzadok Maihi. What exactly was this cure for Rabbi Tzadok? Yoma Kama Ashkiyu Amaya Depari. So the first day, they gave him water with coarse flour in it. The um, water that had coarse flour soaked in it, so it's mostly water, and a little bit of whatever dissolves from the coarse flour. Lemachar maya de sipuka. The next day, water with sipuka, and sipuka is, is, is also coarse flour of a kind, but it has a little bit of regular flour in it as well. Lemachar maya de kimcha, and then the next stage, water with flour in it, and the idea is that more will dissolve, and you get more nutrition that way. And the Rabbach made porta porta until he was healed little by little. That's how they healed uh, Rabbi Tzadok. Okay. 
I, th- I assume that's brought here just to illustrate just how much Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Tzadok had done in his prayers and fasting for Jerusalem, such that he was now emaciated to such an extent that this was necessary to, to resuscitate him. And then we get the terrible story of Titus. Azal Shadre Letitus. But I pause here for a second. Questions that uh, anything we haven't addressed? I'll uh, stop sharing for the moment so I can see everybody. Nope. Okay. So let's go back to uh, to the Gemara. Rabbi? Yes, Alan. Well, the question I was going to ask you, how common was it for the Roman government to give offerings? Because yeah, going back, you were saying the uh, the the great uh, archonsolic uh, first thing, and now we're reading how the Romans were... Uh, at the uh, temple site and all that, did they do with offerings for a non uh, government on a regular basis, or just this was like one of the blue things? So that's a good question. That's a good question. We know that the Persians were in the habit of honoring those they, gods of those they conquered and even claiming them as their own. So we do have that kind of precedent. Um, we we also see it a little bit with the Assyrians, interestingly. Um, I don't know about that, except that there's an awful lot of similarity between the Greek gods and the Roman gods. Even as the names change, there's an awful lot of similarity in the mythos between one and the other. And I wonder if they didn't, in fact, adopt things. But in this case, the offering they sent was a test. Right? It was specifically, let's see what the Jews do with this. Let's see if they're actually rebelling against us. So I would view this as a little bit unique anyway. Weren't they always testing the Jews because Rome's had like little uh, stables in Israel and they also always came to see uh, what the Jews are doing? I mean, they had soldiers there. They had garrisons in there. But this was in sp- investigating a particular claim that the Jews were plotting revolt. Yeah. Okay. So, Azal Shadre Latitus, they sent Titus. And here, the Gemara quotes a verse from Parshas Hazinu, the end of Deuteronomy. The Amar E Elohemo Tsurcha Sayuvo. This is part of a section in Deuteronomy in which the, the text describes how in the future, when the Jews fall to their enemies, the enemies are going to say, Where is their God anyway? Where is this rock? who they took Shum, they, they, they said they would take shelter in. Where is this God? So that is what Titus is all about. Ze Titus Harasha, that is Titus. Shachirev vegidev klape mala, who blasphemed towards heaven. Ma'asa, what did Titus do? Tafas zona biado, he took a woman of ill repute with him. Vinichnas lebeish kadshe akadashim, and he entered the Holy of Holies. V'itzia sefer Torah, and he spread out a Torah, aleha avera, and in the Holy of Holies, which is a place where only the high priest gets to go, and then only as part of these rituals of Yom Kippur, the, um, he goes in there with this zona and commits an avera on a Torah. V'natal sayev v'gideres ha'parochas. And he took his sword and he slashed the parochas, the curtain, in front of the Aron, in front of the Ark. V'nasa neis. And a miracle happened, and blood dripped from this parochas, the curtain. I saw one commentator who suggested that this could have been the blood from Yom Kippur, because on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol would bring in blood from an offering and sprinkle it towards the Aron. The problem is that it was not supposed to be sprinkled on the curtain. It was just towards the curtain. Nonetheless, he slashes the curtain, and blood is coming out. It's some kind of message for sure. I see there's a message in the chat, so I'm just going to see if I can read that. Um, but I think I'm going to have to stop sharing. There we go. Um, ah, so someone asked, why are some words in green ink? The answer is that the text that I'm sharing with you is from the Bar Ilan CD ROM. Bar Ilan University puts it out, and the the um, the text has certain words that you can click on in order to get commentaries or other text. So here, I imagine, I haven't tried it, but I imagine if I were to click on the green word there, the green word here, I would get the biblical text that it's quoting. Okay? 
So they, um, so he he slashes the curtain. You get this blood emerging. The ukasavur haragas atzmo. And he thought, literally, that he had killed himself. But it doesn't mean that he had killed himself. It's a euphemism. Titus thinks he has somehow harmed God. Shenamar, and they quote you a verse. Shagut tzorecha bekerav moadecha samu ososam osos. Your enemies have, ro- have roared in the midst of your moed, the place of your meeting. They made their signs into signs. He reads this as a sign. That's not what this was. It's not a message that he has killed God or, or harmed God. Of course not. That's nonsense. The point is not that at all. The point is to send him a message of the gravity of what he's done. Abba Hanan Omer. Here we get a couple of verses quoted by the sages remarking on the fact that God is able to watch this happen and do nothing. So Abba Hanan said, there's a verse, Mi kamocha chasin ya? Who is like you, God, who is so tough? So he says, on that verse, Mi kamocha chasin v'kasheh, who is like you to be so tough, shata shomea ni utso v'gidufo shal osa, rasha v'shoseik. You hear the blasphemy of that wicked person, and you're silent. How could you be silent? God, how could you let this go on? No, one more. Devei Rabbi Yishmael Tana, they turn the yeshiva of Rabbi Yishmael, Mi kamocha ba'elim, Hashem, that's a verse we know of, of course, from the song at the sea, after the Jews crossed through the sea. But literally, who is like you among the powerful beings, God? But they changed Be'elim to Michamocha Ba'ilmim. Who is like you, God, among those who are Elaim? Elaim can mean strong, but it's not what it means here. It means those who can't speak, those who are mute. Who is like you, God, among the mute? In other words, you don't say anything no matter what they do. Look what you allowed Titus to do. How could he not have been struck down? Ma'a, so what did Titus do? Nadas aparochas. He takes that curtain that he slashed. Vaso kamin gargusni. And he makes it into a kind of sack. Vevi kokel. By the way, I, I, it's a complete side note, but it, it's unclear where this curtain was. In the, uh, in the second temple. There's a whole other discussion about that. Just wanted to comment on it so you should be aware. But he makes it into, into a sack or into multiple sacks. And he brought all the vessels from the temple. And he put them in the sacks. And he put them on a boat so that he could go be praised in his home city. Side note here taking the vessels of the temple home with him. What does that remind you of? Taking the vessels of the temple home with him. If we learn that they, oh, I can't remember where, but that he took, he gave the door and all the, the things inside the, um, the beta meat dash to appease the... When we learned it was... Right, so Susan, is rem- right. So, so Susan is remembering that Hizkiyahu at one point sends gold from the temple to appease um, the enemy. He also displays the, uh, the vessels to, um, to people who are either Babylonians or Assyrians, depending on how you read the 39th chapter in Yeshaya. So that is correct. And then there, on that spot, God says the enemy is going to take away the gold and silver is going to take away the vessels, a reference to what King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon went on to do. Nebuchadnezzar took away the vessels of the temple, he stored them with his idols, and then his grandson Belshazzar took them out and celebrated with them at a party and drank from them, and ultimately Cyrus returns them to the Jews when they build the second temple. So by giving us and emphasizing here that Titus takes them away, we link the two destructions and say it's the first destruction all over again. Now we're getting the um, the sorry. Now we're now we're getting the the a reiteration of that first destruction as he takes these uh, these vessels away. Okay. Well, not not okay. None of this is okay. But you know what I mean. We get a comment from a verse on this, on him taking the vessels. Because it says, 
he dug, he took all the temples, ve'nichan bahen, he put them in the sack, he took the vessels and put them in the sacks that he made, ve'oshivan basfina, put them on his boat, le'lech le'ishtabeach bi'iro, to go be praised in his city. That line is taken from a verse from Ecclesiastes, from Kohelas, which they quote here, Shinamar, as the text says, uv'chein ra'isi rishaim kivurim vavau, u'imakom kadosh yahalechu, v'yishtakchu ba'ir asher kein asu. So this verse, in context, is classic cynicism in Ecclesiastes. He says, I have seen the wicked, right? They uh, buried and they came. They walked from a holy place. They are forgotten in the city for what they did. Whatever they did is long forgotten. But he, but the way we're going to read it is, Al Tikri Kvurim, don't read it as buried in the city. It's not that the wicked are buried. El Kvutsim, they're gathered. And don't say they're forgotten. They're praised. In other words, we're saying everything is flipped on its head. The wicked are supposed to be buried and forgotten. And instead, they're gathered and they're being praised. Or, another way to take the word buried, kivurim, ika di amri, some say it as kivurim mamish, literally buried, and not in the sense that they are buried, but rather, da filumili di mitamran igal yelahon. Even that which is buried is exposed to them, they had access to everything. Titus could take whatever he wanted and nothing stopped him. So the sages are expressing their surprise by flipping biblical verses around in order to emphasize how shocking it is that Titus gets away with this. Look how he has succeeded. We get to the next part of his story and the last part of his story that I think we're going to uh, to do. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. Right. Yes, Alan. The, the, uh, the Titus... Wasn't, you said he took it to his hometown, but don't we see this in Rome Dark, the, how the Romans are celebrating when everything was returned to Rome? Yeah, well this is, this is, that's his hometown. Oh. Yeah. So a wave comes up in the sea to drown him when he gets out onto the water. He's out in his boat, the, um, and a big wave comes up. Amar, he said, I think the God of these Hebrews is only powerful on the water. I've read their legends. Pharaoh, he drowned them in the sea. Sisra, Sisra, right, head of the armies of, uh, of Canaan in Shoftim, in Judges, chapters 4 and 5. He was drowned in the water. Susan says, what are you talking about? Yael killed Sisra. It wasn't that. So you could suggest it's because he asked for water and she gave him milk, and that's part of what makes him sleep, as Devorah says there in chapter 5. But Rashi says that it's because before he gets to her, his armies are defeated because in Nachal Kishon, in the wadi of Kishon, it suddenly floods with water, and the, their chariots sink into the mud. And that's why Sisra flees to Yael's tent. So his army is defeated in water. So now he wants to, to drown me. It's interesting, he didn't mention the flood. No mabul here, he didn't mention the flood also, right? That's, that's what I would have thought of first, with God punishing people with water. Nonetheless, he says, so now God wants to fight me with water too. In Giborhu, if he's not just Neptune, God of the sea, but he's really mighty, let him fight me on land says Titus. That's the hubris of the, uh, of the man. Of course, from a Jewish theological perspective, the reason why... I see your hand, Ricky. Hang on. The, um, the reason why he's vulnerable now at sea the, um, is because he's put himself in a place of danger. In other words, it's one thing when you're not in danger, God isn't necessarily going to create something to harm you. However, you put yourself in a place of danger, God's not going to protect you. And therefore, the water is about to uh, is about to drown him. So God has his way of dealing with this. But Ricky has a question. Yes. How come this uh, Roman general know about the biblical story of this So the Romans were very familiar with biblical stories. They um, even before Christianity came, because this is pre-Christian. Even bef- I mean, it's not pre-Christian. It's before Christian conquest of Rome. The, um, but the biblical stories, if you read the Roman writers from that day, they're very familiar. Ovid, you know, as one, I, I'm, 
I believe Ovid is before him, the, um, is one example. But they, they are familiar with the, uh, the classic teachings of biblical text. Having said that, I don't know that we're actually reproducing Titus' words word for word. The, um, it's possible that this is not meant to be literally what he said. Mm-hmm. Um, however, yes, you know, they, they were aware of biblical text. Susan is looking up Ovid to figure out when he lived. When did he live? You're muted. Just broke down. It's Ovid before Titus. Ah. And, uh, I see uh, Rebecca's hand, so after... Uh, after we get the answer on this. Sorry? Yeah. They're talking about Shakespeare, not the, the Greeks. They're talking about the play. I'll have to change. Okay, Rebecca, ask your question while Susan um, does our historical research. I mean, I, I just am wondering, I mean, this isn't a history list. This isn't a history book. This Correct. is our rabbis writing hundreds of years later, and there's a message for us. This isn't necessarily verbatim what happened or verbatim what happened. I think, don't we have to remember that? Yeah, no, that was the that was what I said to Ricky. That was my second answer to Ricky. My first answer is you should know they are aware, the um, which is true. The um, but my second point was I don't know that this is an attempt to reproduce the words of Titus as much as to teach us lessons. The um, but I, I, it wouldn't shock me at all that you know, to, to have the uh, the Roman general say this. But Susan, when did Ovid live? Ovid was born in 43 B.C. and lived to 1718 A.D., known as Ovid. Yeah. Um, so, in the English-speaking world was Roman Paul, who lived during the reign of Augustus. Yes, so he is a generation or two before this. I mention him only because I've seen his discussions of Judaism, but there were others as well. Um, there, there definitely was familiarity, but I, again, I, I don't think this has to be the direct words of Titus now. Okay, so... We have to get God's response. It is, it is a very dramatic story. Yes. They, um, so look at what happens. Yotis Abaskol, a voice came out, Va'amrolo, and said to him, Russia ben Russia ben Benosha Esav Harasha, wicked one, son of a wicked one, grandson of wicked Esav. And that goes with the whole Rome, Edom, Esav connection. He says... I have a light creature in my world. The Yitush Shema, it's called a gnat. Why is it called a light creature? Because it eats, but as far as we can tell, we don't see it excrete. That's how light it is. The, um, it, it, it's not... Uh, sorry? It's a mosquito. Yeah, a gnat or a mosquito, either way. It's a very small creature. Go up on land and see if you can fight that. You want to fight me, God says. Do me a favor, fight the gnat first. Then we'll have a conversation. This, by the way, I've always believed, I've always, I've long believed, is connected to a Gemara in Suvos. The Gemara there says, Hakobi de shamayim chutz mitzinim upachim. Everything is in the hands of heaven except for tzinim pachim, which we understand to mean colds and chills and fevers, viruses. There was no intent when I started on this to, to make a pandemic reference. I apologize. But the, um, but the Gemara says everything is in God's hands except those. Those that people have to be careful about themselves. As the Pasuk says, Shobar Nafsho Yerchak Mehem, someone who, who guards himself will distance himself from them. Engage in distancing, that's the advice in, uh, in Mishlei for, for Tzinim Pachim. That's one Gemara. However, what are those two things? Tzinim Pachim. Tzinim Pachim. The, um, it's Ksuvo, somewhere in the Lama, it's Lama, Lama, Gimel, somewhere around there. The, um, but that's one Gemara. You have another Gemara that says that the Hakol um, Bidei Shamayim Chutz Meiras Shamayim. Everything is in God's hands except for awe of heaven. God doesn't force people to revere Him. God leaves that in your hands. 
So how is it that on the one hand you're saying everything is in God's hands except for awe of heaven, and on the other hand everything is in God's hands except for chills and colds and fevers and whatnot? So I, I, I thought to explain that the idea is that if a person it does not have awe of heaven, if a person is arrogant, then God says, I'm going to bring them down through my tiny, tiny creature. Viruses, chills, fevers, and so on, because there is nobody who has lost their dignity. There is nobody who is humiliated as much as somebody who has a cold. You see, okay. people... They, I'm, again, I'm not making a pandemic reference. That's, that's entirely incidental and not intended. My point is that you see a person who is normally someone of great dignity and stature, and you see them with a cold and how they're reduced to coughing and sneezing and blowing their nose. That's the way God takes down people who are arrogant. And so that's what he does here with Titus. And now I'll go back to the Gemara to show you. He says, Titus, you think you're so tough. Let's see how you do with, the, with this gnat. Let's see how you do with the mosquito. So, Alalei Abasha, he goes up on land. Along comes a gnat, and it enters his nostril. And it knocks away for seven years. The language in the text is Nakar Bemocho. Moach is a term in general for soft tissue that is inside of a solid bone. So we use it to mean the brain, but we also use it to mean marrow. Same term. So it's banging away at something that it finds by going up his nose, whether it actually goes through all the membranes to get to the brain, or whether it's eating away at other stuff, I don't know. But it's there for seven years. Yom Achad, one day, Titus is passing the entrance to a blacksmith shop. He hears the banging, the hammer on the anvil. Ishtik. And the gnat goes silent. Right? It thinks that someone else is banging outside. It's attracted. Titus says, oh, there's something you can do about it. Every day they brought a blacksmith in front of Titus and had the blacksmith spend the day banging on the anvil in front of Titus. I can't imagine this was much of a life. They, um, but he's happy because at least the banging is not inside his head, now it's outside. For a non-Jew blacksmith, they would pay him four zuz, which is a big sum of money. Right? Two goats, two, two zuz buys you a young goat. So they'd pay him four zuz for a non-Jewish blacksmith to hammer in front of him that day. If it was a Jewish blacksmith, I don't know, there are many Jewish blacksmiths, but if it was a Jewish blacksmith, they would, um, then he wouldn't pay him. He would just say, you should be happy that you see your enemy in this condition. Did that for up to 30 days. Mikan ve'elech, Kevan did dash dash, but after that, the gnat got used to it. They uh, and therefore it didn't get distracted, and therefore it kept right on uh, banging. Tanya, the sages taught. Amar Rabbi Pinchas ben Arova. Rabbi Pinchas ben Arova said, "Ani ayisi ben gedole Romi. I was among the leaders in Rome." Ukshemes, and when Titus died, patzchu es mocho. They smashed open his skull. Umatsu Bokitsi poor drawer Mishkal Shne Slaim and they found this this gnat was like a wild bird weighing two sela. That was how much it ate over the seven years. Bimas Nisatana, and then we have another lesson from the sages of Braisa Kigozal Ben Shana, like a dove, a year old dove, Mishkal Shne Litrin weighing two liters, and Amr Abaye Abaye says Naktinan. We have learned, and the term naktina often means that it's halacha, although clearly not here. It's not a halachic statement. It's not a law. Piv shal nechoshes v'tzipornov shal barzel. Its beak was of copper, and its nails were of iron. This was not just any gnat that we're, uh, that we're talking about. But if you'll note there, um, since I'm showing the page, you see the asterisk I'm pointing to here. It takes you to the margin to a comment from the Sefer Hasidim, Rabbi Yudah Hasid in the 12th century, who says the idea of a comparison to the bird is because he exiled the Jews who are compared to a Yonah, who are compared to a dove. 
So that's the uh, that's the image that's the image here. So that concludes this part of the story. The Gemara then goes on to talk about Titus having a nephew who wants to convert to Judaism, who summons Titus to ask him whether he should convert or whether he should not convert, and it goes through discussion about the uh, the merits of conversion to Judaism and the punishments awaiting the wicked who don't repent, but it really isn't Tisha B'av related, and so I would. Uh, uh, and so I would um, suggest skipping that. So I'm jumping to the line that you see here. I just need to condense this to make room for it. Tachazi. It's the first wide line on the next page. Actually, no, that doesn't make sense. That's the closure of that. Tanya is where I want it. The second wide line. Tanya. I'm Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Elazar says, Bo kama gedola kocha shel busha. See how great is the power of humiliation. Going back to the beginning of our story. He says, unlike Rabbi Yochanan, the Rabbi Yochanan's lesson from this was about the, the defective leadership that didn't bring things in line when they were called upon to do so. Rabbi Elazar says, look at the, the power of humiliation. God helped Bar Kamsa in the expense of destroying his temple. He destroyed his house. He burned his sanctuary, all because of what happened with, uh, with, with the humiliation of Bar Kamsa. So that concludes the Kamsa and Bar Kamsa story. There actually is much more Gemara there, but I've been standing for an hour and 40 minutes, and I'm still fasting. So I think I'm on balance going to pause here, um, and um, I wish everybody a smooth rest of the fast. Um, Rebecca, your hand is up. I didn't know if you had a question. Thank you. Sorry. Is there a question? Oh, it must be still. Oh, from before. Okay.